Um, it's always seemed um, to me, and I think Zoe would, would agree with this, that uh, Michigan is such a distinctive place. Philosophically, it's distinctive um, in terms of the personalities who have been here and who are here. Um, and uh, we figured that for the first uh, alumni conference, we hope of, of many, many more, that it would be good to hear from people who sort of um, have experienced uh, different versions of Michigan who are sort of um, at, at the core of what Michigan is. Um, and so we reached out to them and they very generously agreed to, um, to do this uh, with, I apologize, very little guidance. But the reason that there was very little guidance um, was because we wanted, to, we, we wanted to leave it to you, what you think is um, important about Michigan, what's compelling about Michigan, what's distinctive, what's, uh, what, anything you want to say. So um, with that in mind, um, Peter Railton uh, I also asked, and he very, very um, generously sent us uh, some prepared remarks. Uh, so Zoe is going to read them for us. All right. Hello, my name is Peter Relton, and I am <laughs> present at this conference. <laughs> Warmest greetings to all. I very much wish I could be there with you to celebrate the department and the wonderful philosophers who have emerged from it and will be emerging from it in the years to come. I thank Zoe and Daniel for taking the initiative and doing so much work to make this event possible. And I'd like to thank Holly and Karen and Nate and Connie and Nishi, former students who do us great honor in traveling to Ann Arbor to take part. And of course, Uma, Caroline, Lingxi, Zoe, and Daniel, current students who rose to the challenge of providing comments on the talks. For Liz, Alan, and Jim, I don't have the words to say thanks for all that you've done over the years to make this department such an exciting and collegial place to be. In our former colleague Scott Shapiro's 2011 book, Legality, he writes of the Michigan Philosophy Department that it is, quote, that rare place on earth where brilliance and decency go hand in hand. <laughs> and Peter clarifies that's on page 449. <laughs> in my time at Michigan, I've had many colleagues who embody these ideals, but none I think more perfectly than Liv, Allen, and Jim. And I'm very sorry not to be able to hear their remarks today. For myself, Peter Robin. I simply want to say that I've never been prouder than I am today to be a member of the Michigan Department. The faculty and students here are showing more than ever that dedication to teaching, diversity, and doing philosophy that matters, that are integral parts of brilliance and decency. I see the next generations in the department as leading the way forward in the very old, very demanding, but always renewing and rewarding discipline and many, many feelers, and I've always said no. And why? Um, well, I found that the atmosphere, the intellectual climate at the University of Michigan has been absolutely ideal for the style of work that I do. Um, because it's not just the philosophy department, but in fact the whole university, that it has historically been incredibly open to interdisciplinary thought, to learning from colleagues in other departments and indeed other schools. Um, and this has characterized my own career here. I taught in a law school. I taught global justice jointly with an economist. 
I taught a graduate seminar jointly with a sociologist here. I have been involved historically in reading groups that cut across multiple disciplines and engage graduate students and uh, faculty <coughs> from multiple disciplines, including history and political science and so forth. So, and this is a place where the departments and even the schools are not siloed in their self-contained areas, but genuinely open to each other, and that, for me, has been the ideal place. And so I wanted to bring us back to why maybe Michigan is like that. And so I'm going to start with some words which, with which you ought to be extremely familiar, okay? It says, religion, morality, and knowledge <laughs> being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. I'm sure you've noticed this because you've passed under those words hundreds or even thousands of times. And then you might reflect, well, what on earth? For one thing, like, what's that religion thing doing there? Like, for a public university? Like, isn't there something about the establishment clause? And, and then, <laughs> okay, so where do those words come from? Well, in fact, they are direct, they're a direct quote from the Northwest Ordinance of 1789, uh, which was a law passed prior to the adoption of the United States Constitution under the Articles of Confederation that did two very important things. One is they prohibited slavery in the Northwest Territories, which included all of Michigan. And the other thing they did was provide for the establishment of public universities. So, University of Michigan was actually chartered under the authority of the Northwest Ordinance in 1817, and this year we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of U of M. Yay! Okay, so now I'm going to bring up our tale to uh, Angel. So that's our building. We're in Angel Hall, and who's this Angel guy? <laughs> well, this is James Angel, the president of U of M from 1871 to 1909. And one of, Angel had an ambition for University of Michigan. He was gonna turn this backwater university in the boondocks into a world-class research university. That was his ambition, and as you know, it ultimately succeeded. <laughs> well, how, what was his strategy for achieving this objective? Goal number one. I shall tell you, I am not the John Dewey professor for nothing. <laughs> he hired John Dewey. He hired some other distinguished people. Uh, but Dewey was one of the, you know, one of his great <coughs> achievements. He hired Dewey in 1884, and Dewey spent the first 10 years of his philosophical career here <coughs> at University of Michigan. <coughs> so it's worth thinking about Dewey's, Dewey's intellectual influences and how that, I think, affected the character of the university. So one thing you should know about Dewey's intellectual career was that he was something, he was raised, of course, as a Christian, as everybody was in those days, and educated in a conventional Christian school. Uh, but what really fired it up, him up was Darwin and the theory of evolution. And he rapidly saw that if you took this seriously, <laughs> you couldn't really take the Bible literally. <laughs> <laughs> and so, while he was at U of M, <coughs> although he was still a Christian, <coughs> and even taught courses in Bible study, one of his students remarked at the time, he evidently claimed to be a Christian, but he was certainly the most liberal one I had ever met. <laughs> now, what this meant 
Dewey had a very clear idea of what this meant. And throughout his whole career, Dewey saw that the complete domination of American higher education by the churches was inimical to the progress of higher education. And because they engaged in preaching and not teaching, right? You had these dogmas in the Bible and they're just passed down to the next generation. And his goal, which was inspired by evolutionary theory and by psychology, the emerging science of psychology was, instead of teaching fixed dogmas from the past, to teach students methods of inquiry so that they could forge future paths and discover new knowledge that hadn't just already been like written down somewhere. And that's the basic idea of a modern research uh, university. Um, <clears throat> and so Dewey then thought that for philosophy to make progress in inquiry, it did have to engage other disciplines. So if you look at some of the courses he taught, they included courses in, these are the course titles, empirical psychology, special topics in psychology, psychology and philosophy. Uh, so <clears throat> what we see here is right from the very birth of University of Michigan as a research institution, one of the greatest philosophers who I think deeply shaped not just the philosophy department, but indeed the entire intellectual tradition that U of M uh, continues to this day, he saw very clearly that progress and in inquiry requires a cooperation of the disciplines. And I think that tradition has helped inform some of the distinctive features of philosophy at U of M. Friendliness to naturalistic approaches, taking very seriously, moral psychology, empirical work in all the social sciences, and not least uh, great respect also for learning from the history of philosophy and relearning that. So we have a wonderful tradition also of study in the history of philosophy, recovering perhaps lost uh, lot lessons that had once been learned and, and lost and, and recovering that uh, uh, for, for reuse and reconfiguration, which I think is also uh, uh, an important feature, especially of uh, ethics at U of M. Well, uh, I didn't prepare anything, but uh, I think we can continue the, the story. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Frankino was uh, with his wife on this, uh, spending a year in Europe, uh, the year of sabbatical art. Uh, retirement furlough as it then was uh, when I arrived and uh, uh, so but uh, Bill had been a graduate student here after uh, being uh, coming from a, a very uh, strongly Calvinist uh, uh, Orthodox family and uh, going to Calvin College uh, Bill uh, when Yale fired uh, Stevenson for having a immoral theory, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> his colleagues saw the opportunities and uh, got Stevenson to come here. Um, and then I was, like Liz, I was an undergraduate at uh, Swarthmore, but uh, when I was at Swarthmore, the department was very much uh, uh, Richard Brandt's, of Richard Brandt's making, I think, Grant had gotten to Swarthmore about uh, uh, about 1940. Uh, he was uh, 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 
he was from a strongly Christian background, and his uh, work had been on Schleiermacher, whom I don't know much about, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, and even though he'd spent a, at least a year at Cambridge, uh, I don't know if he was an analytic philosopher when he got to Swarthmore, but he certainly became one, <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, when I, I didn't have direct dealings with him until my senior year, but then I took a, a, the Swarthmore system was, if you were in the honors program, you took two seminars per term, and I took his moral philosophy seminar as a, uh, as a senior, and, uh, and it was a really thrilling experience. Well, uh, uh, Frank and Ed Stevenson got Brandt to come a year after I graduated in 1964, and uh, I visited Brandt every so often. I was very disappointed when uh, when I went to look for a job, and he didn't seem to have any interest in me. <laughs> but uh, then I got a call saying uh, Stevenson has decided to retire, and uh, and uh, so we'd like to like you to come to campus, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, that. I always say that uh, I came in Stevenson's budget line and immediately my philosophical ideas began to change. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, uh, when I, uh, I was at Pitt and so that was a wonderful department and I had a very hard time figuring out where I wanted to be and it was partly uh, a two-body question but, uh, but uh, I would, and partly a question, do I want to grow up in a uh, university-centered community or a sort of broader uh, community? Uh, but uh, what Brent did was have a dinner with, uh, uh, with uh, guests from uh, a number of departments, uh, including uh, Michael Oxenberg from Political Science, uh, who's been at Swarthmore as, um, as a little ahead of me as an undergraduate. Uh, very importantly, uh, Dick Nisbet and Susan. Uh, and uh, see, I'm not sure who the other one was, but uh, his idea was to make it vivid to me what uh, that uh, the big contrast, or a big contrast between Pitt and uh, and Michigan was that Michigan was situated at a major university and uh, uh, and uh, had resource uh, as Liz was saying had resources from uh, uh, top resources and a wide array of fields but when I got here uh, uh, I think four other members of the department had uh, Swarthmore background. So uh, Larry Sklar uh, had his first job was at Swarthmore. Uh, Jaguan Kim's first job was at Swarthmore, and he taught me uh, symbolic logic. And, uh, and then John Bennett, who I didn't know it when I was at Swarthmore, had uh, any philosophical interests. I uh, knew him when I was a senior, and he was a freshman, but I knew that he. Uh, had was marvelous at singing uh, Don Ottavio and other <laughs> Mozart tenor parts. Uh, so, uh, but uh, Michigan, of course, lived up to the promise that uh, Liz has been talking about of being a wonderful place for all sorts of connection. So the first, uh, uh, the first term I was here, uh, Steve Stitch and Dick Nisbet and. Uh, and psychology did a joint seminar on um, mm. philosophy of psychology, and uh, I, I remember uh, at that time, uh, I mean, Michigan could have been even greater at that time. Uh, the Michigan ambition was to hire what they called the Jerusalem Four, and uh, 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 Amos and Barbara Tversky, and, and uh, uh, Danny Kahneman, and Dan Treisman. Uh, and uh, well, that uh, that didn't work out. But Michigan still has always had a 
marvelous psychology department, which we philosophers have been uh, privileged to uh, deal with. Uh, there are other departments that we've been privileged to deal with. Uh, and uh, I remember going over for a drink at Steve Stitch's house after the first session, and uh, he was talking about getting the Jerusalem Four, and uh, I asked who's Amos Tversky, and Dick Nisbet said, uh, He's the greatest philosopher in the, or sorry, greatest psychologist in the world. And uh, then uh, later I heard uh, Dick described that way. Uh, so, and then the, my second year, uh, uh, Steve Stitch had unfortunately left, but, uh, uh, but, uh, 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 but uh, Dick Nisbet and Al Goldman did a seminar, and that was thrilling. Too. So uh, I was, when I came, I was doing a lot of work in social choice theory, so I got a lot of, um, a lot of uh, chance uh, to talk with economists here, uh, economic theorists especially, and uh, they, uh, I began to uh, learn, I'm pretty oblivious to public opinion, but uh, it, at times I got hints that uh, uh, Michigan was regarded as sort of uh, weird and oddball in philosophy and that we were interested in things outside academic philosophy. <laughs> uh, and I thought that was a, a terrific thing. And, uh, and when I've, uh, when we've done graduate admissions, uh, I've uh, very much thought uh, well, we shouldn't require people to be philosophy undergraduate majors. We want people who uh, know something outside academic philosophy. And I think we've done well on that point. So it's a, a thrill now to, uh, uh, to uh, see people who were uh, brilliant graduate students and they're now brilliant uh, mature uh, philosophers. And, uh, uh, so I've, uh, taught everybody in this group except uh, Holly and uh, and she was my colleague for a few years and that was uh, that was marvelous uh, and uh, uh, I, I forget whether I taught you in any courses Jim but uh, I knew uh, <laughs> but I certainly knew you as the uh, best uh, I think the best grader I ever had. And then uh, you went away for a while and came back with a, this marvelous dissertation. I was on the committee for that. And uh, uh, Dan was uh, wonderful to have around. And uh, he and uh, Justin Darms would come in and talk with me about things that were very central to my uh, to my issues so uh, uh, so uh, I mean, there are a few other people here are, uh, Michigan PhDs and, uh, and uh, they, but I mean it's really a thrill to see that our well I mean our department can't of course take the major credit for the uh, wonderful people who have been talking with us, but I hope it gets some of the credit <laughs> of that. It's been a thrill to teach them, uh, uh, or be a colleague of uh, all these people at, uh, at earlier stages in their uh, philosophy career. And, to, uh, and I, I think uh, the sort of broad, I think the uh, Sort of broad conception of philosophy has become much more uh, prominent in the world than it was when uh, people <coughs> regarded it as a, an oddball quirk of the department, and uh, and that's very gratifying. How much of that is Michigan's influence? I don't know, but uh, uh, it's certainly the uh, place I came to partly for that, and uh, and it's been very gratifying to. To have, uh, so I thank all you people. So, uh, so I came in 
1980 as like a graduate student, and I'll sort of start there and talk about the departments that I have known. I sort of divide it up into three. Um, so uh, the, the department was very sort of different uh, at that time, and the graduate program was very, very different. Um, so um, I ended up coming to Michigan um, uh, because uh, my advisor, I went to a small school, my advisor had heard of Ellen Gibbard <laughs> and, and had heard of a few people at Michigan who actually at the time weren't there. This was before, 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 before sort of the lighter report. So, and so, you know, and so, um, uh, um, uh, and so I ended up, I ended up sort of coming to Michigan actually thinking that, I think that Brandon Franken and were still here. My advisor thought that Al Goldman and Holly Goldman were still here. They weren't. They, they, they just left. And um, there are all these people like Kit Fine, who my advisor had never heard of. Um, so anyway, I arrived in a class of 11, um, two women, which made our class very special, because usually it was zero. Um, uh, and um, uh, the program was very sort of different than you taught from day one. Um, it was kind of expected that, you know, um, about half of the people weren't going to make it, which was true in my class. Um, uh, and I have a sense that the difference, that sort of the distance between the faculty and the students was much greater than. So, sort of to take an example, our offices were actually at the far end of the hall, um, uh, you know, down where sort of classics is. Um, uh, um, and, and so it had kind of a different feel. So, but, but, um, uh, I mean, at that time, Jaguan Kim was chair, um, and I think uh, uh, Jaguan Kim was chair. Louis Loeb was here. Louis retired from the department. Uh, but you know, Alan was here. Larry was here. Ken was here. Peter Railton had kind of just arrived, um, and. Uh, David Vellman had just arrived. Um, uh, so that's kind of the department that I came into. That department stayed fairly stable, more or less, throughout my graduate career. Kit Fine left, Steve Darwell came, which was huge, because that sort of gave us this kind of presence in ethics, which, um, uh, well, it's added to our presence in ethics, I think. Um, well, we had the... Uh the great three before right. I was here, right? But and, and uh, I, I kept saying, well, we can't expect that we'll be able to rebuild in the same field of strength. Turns out we were able to. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, so anyway, I uh, I did sort of my graduate work here. It was uh, um, uh, it, it was um, it was a prelim system, so it was much less sort of course based and uh, um, and. You know, I think one of the bigger, uh, one of the major differences is we didn't have any, any sort of money over the summer, so we had to work. So, I mean, that was a common issue. Um, but then, as Ellen mentioned, I went away to Washington and uh, I wrote a, a dissertation there. Um, and I went in the job market and I applied, and it was a sort of pretty good year on the job market. Like. I bet there were 100 more jobs available than there were this last year or something like that. And so I had a good year, and I was coming home from a job interview, a job that I was pretty sure they were going to offer me, and I was pretty sure that I was going to take. And my wife had picked me up at the Washington airport. We were driving across the bridge, and she said, Louis Loeb called. Uh, he wants you to come to Michigan to give a talk. And I found that very puzzling, um, because I couldn't figure out why they would want me to come and give a talk. But anyway, it turned out to be, it turned out to be like a job talk. Um, uh, and I took the job with some trepidation, frankly, because you know I was a student here. I wasn't really sure what it would be like. A lot of people told me, a lot of people, you know, other places in particular, told me that would be a terrible idea to go there. Um, uh, but you know, it was a great job. I knew it was sort of a great department, so I came. And I have to say, and I'm, thanks to Alan on this, and thanks to Liz. Liz had. I would say I vividly remember your job talk. 
But it was like totally awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely remember it too, but that was not my eternal <laughs> picture of us. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, but, you know, I, uh, uh, I've always been very sort of grateful to the department that, 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 you know, I came and I was treated from day one like a member of, of the faculty. And it was, uh, you know, so it, I, I never felt, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, I never felt sort of, sort of the least bit like people told me I would feel coming back to the department that I did my graduate work in. But anyway, I get here and this begins the second period, as I think of it, and this is the period of change. Um, you know, from about, I don't know, I'm trying to think when it started, uh, you know, so at one point, fairly close together, Gideon Rosen left, and uh, Steve Diablo and Sally Hasslinger left. And that, I think, began this kind of a period where it really felt like, and there were some of you who are here then, where the, where the department really felt kind of unstable. Um, and it didn't help, coming back to Brian Leiter, in those days, Brian used to put speculations up on his, his website. And, and there was a period, I believe, for five years in a row when it was on the Leiter report that Alan was going to leave. And that in the event that he did, we would drop four places in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, and what's interesting about this place, and I, I just find this one of the great things about Michigan, is um, I think largely because of the sort of the core cadre of people who sort of stayed through the whole thing, right? Um, even though it was a revolving door, Right? We were able to somehow find people to replace the people who were leaving who were of fantastic philosophical quality and, and also, and I think this is what we've done you know, incredibly well, also people who um, are you know, our great colleagues, great teachers. Um, and I'm not sure why we've been able to do this so much. I have a sort of a hypothesis that this isn't the kind of place that sort of the prima donnas want to stay. Um, you know, so if you're only concerned about your career, you know, a big public institution may not be the right place for you. Um, so people sort of move on. Um, uh, but, um, but that period, I mean, I think was um, so challenging and very, um, you know, people were getting outside offers all the time. Um, uh, and then for about the last Eight to ten years, we have sort of like a third department, as I think of it, where we've got a very sort of a stable department, um, uh, somewhat larger department than we have, we've, we've we've had, um, uh, and it does have to be said. I mean, I think a lot of credit has to go to um, you know people who spent long parts of their career here working working hard to keep the place together, to sort of make it work. Um, thanks has to be given to the college, because you really, you know, I mean, I can tell you, there are nearly everybody, or maybe everybody, I don't know, yeah, on this department has had serious outside offers that, you know, people have had to sort of address. And one thing which I really, think is wonderful about Michigan is that from the top to the bottom, it's always been committed to excellence and sort of willing to do sort of what it takes to, you know, make our department great and all the other departments around here great. Um, uh, um, but, you know, I've, um, I've benefited sort of greatly from this place. Uh, uh, I've always thought that, um, uh, you know, w w w one of the things about the place that I, um, I sort of, I like most, and this does have to do with, you know, Alan and Liz and Peter, is that there's been a kind of a, um, uh, sort of expectation of kind of decency that you get. Um, which I have the sense is not 
always there at other departments, right? But you know, you kind of have the sense that, well, you know, everybody's kind of in it together in a way that I think you don't always get at other departments. So it's not, you know, I mean, you know, Alan and Liz have fantastic careers, you know. Um, but I never get to Peter and, you know, many of the people who've been here. But, you know, I've never ever sort of had the sense that, um, you know, sort of concern number one with them was their fantastic a career, right? You know, and, and uh, it makes it a great place to be. Thank you so okay. much, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I, I, what I'm sort of imagining is just like a free form ish conversation. So if you have like thoughts or questions or something like that, feel free to. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking, Jim was talking about the, the period of turmoil, because I was dur there, here during that period. It's funny because for me, there was this incredible stability. I know what you're talking about, but it was sort of in what you might call M&E or a core, where you had a lot of the shifting. But amongst the ethics crew, they just stayed stable for yeah, during right. that period. Right. Which Darwall, Fallaman, yeah. Gibbard, Railton, Liz, it was, the, you guys were all there the whole Right, the whole time, and so for me, it was an extremely stable place to be doing philosophy, and, and everything else you said was right. But yeah, I do remember, right, right, Crimmins came through, Rum, yeah, we had oh, you know, a lot a of huge number. Of people. Yeah, I, I was like trying like to add it up earlier today, I couldn't. Yeah. All right, who's your favorite friend? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have been ridiculing him for the last three days, but you, you might, another um, Michigan Ola of, of my era um, just published a book that was reviewed by the Notre Dame um, NDPR, whatever that stands for, Philosophical Reviews, um, and apparently, apparently our own David Sobel is one of the, uh, or reviewer, one of the titans of moral philosophy. It's written one of the greatest books of book of essays um, in moral philosophy uh, ever. Apparently, it was the review's a little over the top, but um, <laughs> as as I've been pointing out to Dave, continue. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, um, it really was marvelous to be at Michigan with a group of graduate students, including Dave, the titan of moral philosophy. <laughs> um, and I learned an enormous amount from them as well as from the faculty. Yeah, me too. I, I, you guys were ahead of me when I first came in, and instead of shunning me as I would have done, <laughs> <laughs> um, you really, you, all of you actually, you, Justin, Dave, for sure. Um, I remember Mike Weber too. Um, all took me under your wing, and I think I learned a lot from you guys.